Hi everyone, I'm Simone, and welcome to the second installment in my Everything Coming series. In order to properly welcome the last season of Year 6, I'm going to be giving a comprehensive review of everything notable in the pre-season documentation. This includes the pre-season designer notes, the season website, test server patches, and the developer's blog. This video will be chaptered and subtitled for easier viewing. On mobile, check out the timestamps in the description below. If you find this video helpful, please consider supporting the channel by liking and subscribing, and comment down below what your favorite feature coming is. High Caliber, the final season of Year 6, will introduce the 62nd Operator to Rainbow Six Siege on November 30th, 2021. Welcome Thorn, a medium-build Irish Operator joining the defensive side of Siege. A member of the Garda's elite tactical branch, the Emergency Response Unit, Thorn is an emotionally reserved but fiercely loyal and magnetic personality. With her unique ability, the Razor Bloom Shell, Thorn will bring an exceptionally lethal explosive to the defense. Thorn brings three of these small, throwable, sticky gadgets into play, and they can be placed just about anywhere you can toss them. The shell has an activation radius of about 3 to 4 meters, and once placed takes about 6 to 7 seconds to arm. When an attacker walks into the activation radius of an armed Razor Bloom shell, the device will turn red and emit a warning sound. At that point, the attacker has about 4 seconds to make a decision. Retreat, push forward, find and shoot the shell before it detonates, or take a lethal amount of damage. The developers referred to this moment as the panic moment. Oh, fuck! <laughs> While most gadgets are very binary, the outcome of every Razor Bloom shell detonation can vary wildly depending on the choices of the attack before and during the moment of activation, as well as the ingenuity of the defense's utilization of the gadget. The small size of the gadget can make finding it rather difficult, particularly in the heat of the moment, and certain operator synergies can make escape difficult for the attack. Gadgets that slow attackers, such as Malusi's Banshees, Legion's Goo Mines, Clash's CCE Shield, and Barbed Wire, can all be used to prevent the attack from quickly leaving the death zone. Defenders listening for the telltale audio cue of an activated shell will be able to use that cue to push a likely panicking attacker. Much like a vulnerable frost mat placement, some attackers may find it difficult to choose death by gadget or death by waiting defender. This gadget is not without its weaknesses, though. Both deployable shields and Osa's Talon 8 shields are immune to the shrapnel from a detonating shell, and they will completely protect an operator behind it. Thatcher's EMP grenades can disable the gadgets, IQ Scanner can detect them, and they can be destroyed with Twitch's and Flores' drones, and Zero's Argus cameras. The gadget itself is not bulletproof, either. A detonated shell will deal damage to any operator within its range, defenders included, so Thorn must be very careful with her placement decisions. For the first time since Burnt Horizon, Thorn's loadout will introduce a never-seen-before gun to Siege's arsenal. As a primary option, Thorn has access to the UZK 50GI SMG. While still classified as an SMG, the Uzi is equipped with 50 caliber rounds that pack quite the punch on soft surfaces and operators, dealing 44 damage with a 700 fire rate a 22 bullet capacity, and virtually no recoil, this SMG will surely be a force to be reckoned with. Thorn will only have access to the 1x sights, including red dot, holographic, and reflex, and it will have barrel attachment options for suppressor, flash hider, compensator, and muzzle brake. The Uzi can come equipped with the vertical grip or angled grip. If the SMG isn't your cup of tea, Thorn is the third operator, excluding recruit, to have access to the M870 shotgun, or as I call it, the Me Mate. Bandit and Jaeger are the other defenders to have access to this primary. For secondary options, Thorn has access to the 1911 TAC Ops from Maverick's Kit, or the C75 Auto Machine Pistol shared by Vigil, Cali, and formerly Dokubi. Thorn has the option to bring a deployable shield or barbed wire, both of which synergize well with her gadget and intended role. Thorn's official intended role for defense is as an anchor. She will be served best holding down critical choke points, particularly while playing off her Razor Bloom shells. While her gadget does fall into the trap category, it is not an effective anti-rush gadget like Capcan's EDDs or Frost's welcome mats. 
as most running attackers, if allowed to do so unimpeded, will likely enter and leave the area of activation long before it detonates. If unable or unwilling to synergize with other gadgets or operators, the usefulness of the gadget will rely on your attentiveness and creativity to create a situation where the gadget's activation puts the attacker in the situation of dealing with it or dealing with you, but not both nor neither. This seemingly situational dependency of the gadget does seem like a large weakness until you consider its small size, sticky nature, and its extreme lethality. Common attacker repel spots, such as on Villa's study balcony, are a particularly interesting use case for this gadget, as the entering animation locks the attacker in a very vulnerable state during activation, and the delay does not give the attack much time to react to the detonation, if they even recognize what's happening quickly enough. All in all, Thorn's a very interesting addition to the Siege lineup, and I look forward to see how she plays in the future. The release of High Caliber on the test server also introduced some changes to the test server structure and a rework to the R6 fix platform. To better communicate changes in the timeline, the test server will now only be open during three specific times throughout each season, and each phase has its own purpose. The season release phase will only contain content for the new season. This was the phase that released after the High Caliber reveal. The next phase will be the lab release phase. This phase will include experimental content for features that are in early production in order to gain feedback, with the clear intention that these features are likely not soon coming. Finally, the balancing release phase will occur around mid-season to include operator and balancing changes. Isolating just the immediate changes incoming with the season is a nice clear way of knowing what to expect in the new season and does lead to much less confusion on what they intend to release soon and what they're just testing out. More test server adjustments are scheduled for the future as well. A special playlist has been added to the test server, while the normal ones for unranked, ranked, and quick match have all been disabled. The new playlist is called Testing Grounds and helps corral players into a singular game mode in an attempt to reduce queue times. Testing Grounds has no MMR restriction for squads, has no abandon penalty, map ban is removed, and Pro League map pool and new or reworked maps have a higher chance of appearance. Operator ban is enabled, but you cannot ban new or reworked operators. In High Caliber, this meant that teams could not vote to ban Thorn or Valkyrie, for example. Joining in-progress matches was enabled to offset the removal of the abandon penalties and improve queue times. The mode used a mix of unranked and quick match settings. While the removal of the abandon penalty was intended to not punish players whose games crashed due to the inherent instability of the test server, it was frustrating that many players used this as an opportunity to leave if they started on the attacking side or couldn't get the new operator. All in all, these test server changes are pretty cool and I do hope that they improve with time. R6 Fix is the platform from which players can submit bug reports for the live build or test server. The UI of the website has been completely revamped to be easier to use and more welcoming. Developers even have the option to directly interact with users through the comments. I've used the previous iteration of R6 Fix, as well as the new iteration, and I can definitely say that the process for reporting a bug and the satisfaction of doing so has definitely improved tenfold. It feels less like throwing reports into a void and was less frustrating in general to navigate the site. On top of the new operator, High Caliber will bring balancing changes to several operators, the angled grip attachment, gamepad recoil, bulletproof cameras, and EMP effects. Finca is receiving a substantial gadget rework. She will now be able to use her Adrenal Surge to revive herself from the down but not out state, which will put her on par with Doc, who can use his Stim Pistol to do the same. This, combined with the Crystal Guard adjustments to the health system, puts Finca more in line as an active attacking healer. The recoil boost associated with an active surge has also been removed. Prior to this change, Finca's boost reduced the vertical recoil of guns by about half while active. More often than not, this negatively affected veteran players' muscle memory and led to a hindrance more than the buff it intended. In high caliber, the surge will have no effect on recoil, but will maintain its effects on health, concussive states, and so on. The cooldown for the surge has been increased from 10 seconds to 20 seconds.
With the intention of bringing consistency to Intel operators, Echo's Yokai drones and Mozzie's captured drones time outside before losing signal has been increased from 3 seconds to 10 seconds. Operators have also gained the ability to navigate to a camera in the Observation Tools menu before the gadget has finished deploying, which is particularly useful for operators like Zero or Valk. This allows Zero to be a little more ready to utilize the Argus camera's laser before it's shot out by the defense. The original documentation also included the long-awaited feature for Defender cameras losing signal outside, but this feature has been delayed, which we will discuss more in the future feature segment of this video. The Bulletproof camera is a secondary gadget on the defense that is rarely picked over the more appealing gadgets like deployable shield, impacts, or nitro cells. In high caliber, the Bulletproof camera has received a substantial rework. The camera can now rotate to look up, down, and side to side, which exponentially increases the number of places the camera can be deployed and still be useful, the floor included. The cameras have also gained the ability to fire an EMP burst, with an infinite number of bursts and a 10 second cooldown. The EMP effect of the burst lasts about 7 seconds and triggers the deseg state in most attacker electronic devices, wearable and otherwise. The burst area of effect is around 1 to 2 meters, so while it is small, it does not require pinpoint accuracy to disable gadgets. It can easily disable a 4 by 3 grid of Hibana pellets. The burst can be used to disable a gadget on the other side of a reinforced wall as well. The burst has an unlimited range. The camera has no notion of ownership like Maestro's Evil Eyes do, which means that the first live player on the camera has the ability to shoot the burst. Attackers who have hacked the camera with Dokubi are unable to shoot the EMP bursts. The cameras are still vulnerable on their side to bullets and they can be shattered with a melee strike, rendering the camera unable to see and unable to shoot bursts. The state that Thatcher's EMP grenades and the bulletproof camera EMP burst puts gadgets in has been normalized as DSEG, the disabled state of electronic gadgets. High Caliber aims to create more consistent scoring and warning messages as they relate to DSEG and operator access to observation tools while affected have been normalized. Now, both attackers and defenders will be unable to view observation tools like drones or cameras while under the DSEG status effect. The cooldown of gadgets like Yana's clone and Warden's glasses are paused while the operator is under DSEG. Some attackers affected by the bulletproof camera's EMP burst include the following. Yana can be prevented from using her clone by being EMP'd directly, or his clone can be disabled by EMPing the clone directly. Jackal is unable to use his scanner while under DSEG. Thermite's exothermic charge can be affected, as can Habana's pellets. Flores' connection to his Rotero drones can be interrupted by an EMP burst, meaning the drone will continue on its path, with Flores unable to change its course. The drone itself can be halted in its spot in a vulnerable, unarmored state and will arm and explode once the DSEG wears off. Dokubi can be prevented or interrupted from and during her casting of Logic Bomb. Attackers who are under DSEG will not receive Finca's Adrenal Surge if it is activated while they are under its effects. And Finca is unable to use her Adrenal Surge if EMP'd directly. Nomad's air jabs can be disabled as well. And in general, attackers, drones, and claymores can also be disabled. There are some attackers who are not affected by DSEG. Nook was intentionally not included in the list of operators affected by the EMP burst as her gadget is a direct counter to cameras. Her gadget is not affected regardless of if she is using her gadget at the time or not. IQ Scanner is also not affected. Hard Breach Secondaries are not disabled by the burst. Operators who use a detonator to activate their gadget like Fuse will not be prevented from doing so if they themselves are EMP'd, but the gadget itself can usually be disabled. High Caliber is also introducing some weapon balancing changes. First, the increased ADS speed provided by the angled grip attachment is 20% less than it was before, meaning that in High Caliber it will take slightly longer to ADS with an angled grip than it does in Crystal Guard. However, the grip will still provide an increase compared to vertical grip or no attachment at all. Lateral recoil for the following guns have been reduced specifically for gamepad to increase player comfort. Jaeger's Carbine, Ash's R4C, Vigil's K1A, Zofia's M762, Ace and Fuse's AK-12, 
Dokeby Vigil and Warden's SMG-12, Mozzie and Aruni's P-10 Roni, and Alibi's MX-4 Storm. The ability to switch firing mode on some weapons is also being removed. Most primary weapons had the ability to switch between full auto, burst, and single shot mode. In high caliber, this will be removed. Gadgets with different modes, like Zofia's or Capital's gadgets, will maintain that ability. The last map rework in Year 6 revisits Siege's newest map, Outback. The interior and exterior of the map have been modified to give attackers more options in their execution, as well as removing some of the junk within the map and providing better lines of sight. Some of the most notable changes are as follows. During Crystal Guard, the Nature and Bush Ranger bedrooms were renamed to Green and Red Bedrooms. This rework has offered more changes to this bomb site, as Green Bedroom's kitchenette has been extended and the connecting closet has been removed. The piano stairs have been removed, leaving only the hotel stairs, shark stairs, and garage as avenues between floors. Restaurant has been split into two rooms, restaurant and shark. The front entrance has been given an extra doorway to reduce the severity of its choke point. Convenience compressor, gear store, and beer fridge have been condensed into bike repair and mechanic shop. The compressor gear bomb site has been changed to be mechanic shop kitchen. Going upstairs, Garage has seen some substantial changes in orientation and has gained a ladder in addition to its stairs. The door between party room and office has been removed, thus requiring or allowing defenders to make intentional rotations of their choosing. Office supply size has been increased and the window has been replaced with an exterior soft wall. The outdoor terrace that used to connect mezzanine and piano is now an interior room connecting those areas without requiring defenders to test their luck with the detection system. Dorms has gained an exterior soft wall and the overall layout of piano, laundry and dorms area has been greatly adjusted. The dorm laundry bombsite has been moved to laundry piano. Overall, these changes aim to solve some core problems with Outback. The first was difficulty to navigate. Outback was the first map I learned, so I never had much difficulty in this regard. I find the rework more difficult to navigate, particularly in the piano dorms area, but this may very well change as I learn this map, since I'm no doubt affected by my pre-existing understandings of the old version of the map. The developers identified some dangerous choke points in the map, including the garage and entrance, and aimed to fix those. They also removed many of the windows. The reworked version of Outback also aims to improve anchorability for defenders who currently find it hard to stay alive while on site, given the current map's plethora of doors and windows. 
The rework will hopefully improve the general flow of the map's interior and reduce frustrations for players navigating it, both on attack and defense. As always, if you find this video helpful in understanding the many changes coming in the new season, please consider giving it a like and comment down below what you'll miss about old Outback and what you most look forward to in new Outback. If you enjoy R6 content, please consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you. The developers have worked hard to bring some revitalizing changes to Siege. These changes include a revamped and reworked HUD. The visuals have been updated to be more in line with Siege's art direction, including a more blue, gray, and white color scheme, and an overall cleaner aesthetic. The loadout, which includes weapons, gadgets, and unique abilities, are grouped together for more consistent display rules. Inventory and resources are more apparent, and cooldowns for gadgets are kept separate from resources. The compass has been revamped to provide clearer information to the players who want it. The compass is divided into three rings. Pings on the outside most layer indicate pings above your current level, pings on the center ring indicate ping on your level, and pings on the innermost layer indicate pings below your level. The compass also gained the ability to distinguish different types of pings or events, including red pings, yellow pings, death markers when a friendly dies, the location of detected bomb sites, and the diffuser. If a player feels impeded by the advanced compass, the option to use a simpler compass has been given to players in the options menu after some feedback in the test server. Pings will also provide the callout for the room the ping is in, rather than only giving the room you yourself are in. Text action reminders, such as the reminder to press space to vault, have been replaced with icons to take up less space. And following feedback in the test server, the transparency of these icons can be adjusted. Personally, I wish we had the option to use the text or the icons, as some of the icons take up much more vertical space than the text, and some of the icons are not readily apparent in their meaning, but I'm sure it will become the new normal very quickly. The kill cams and spectating views have been adjusted to match the changes. Currently, you'll have the option to turn off the operator card and loadout, and in the future you'll be able to only turn off the card. The pieces of the HUD are able to be extensively customized by the user, so you only need to see what you want to see. On the topic of customization, some new accessibility features have also been added. Notably, gone are the days of blue team versus orange team. Team colors will be static and be customized by the player. For now, the options include blue, orange, and red. Your team will default to blue, and opponents will default to red. And both teams will be referred to as your team versus opponents. The ban phase, kill feed, and other elements will all follow the new color scheme. A brand new addition to the HUD for defenders is a drone counter. Developers acknowledge that the mental count the defenders keep during the prep phase of destroyed drones is a taxing one. They've added a counter that counts the number of regular drones destroyed or regular drones captured by Mozzie. The destruction of special drones, such as those belonging to Twitch and Flores, drones disabled by Mute, and drones destroyed by attackers do not count to the counter. In the options menu, there's a new privacy tab. The Q sniping options have been moved to this tab and include the hidden matchmaking delay and the option to hide region and latency. More options will be added to the privacy tab in the future and will be aimed to improve player protections and privacy. The grenade indicator has been improved to be more reliable regarding its color, white or red, and its relative danger to you. Currently, if a player does not pick an operator during the pick phase, an operator is chosen from them from their list of available operators. In High Caliber, the operator auto-pick will take the player's personal statistics into consideration when picking their operator in the event they are AFK during the planning phase. It is unclear which statistics will be used, but time played will no doubt have a play in the matter. Personally, I hope it uses a combination of recent time frame as well as win rate or KD rather than lifetime time played, rather than lifetime time played. This change will not affect the random button. Operator graphics in the menu have also been improved, particularly in the case of some of the release operators. Finally, some more minor changes coming are as follows. The esports tab is gaining a live notification for whenever an ongoing match is occurring. Alpha packs are gaining a new look to match the new visuals, and the esport packs will give battle pass points rather than duplicates. Finally, Outback will be rotated in to the ranked, unranked, and newcomer playlists, and Border will be rotated out of the newcomer playlist. 
Each test server posts the patch notes for each major test server patch day on Reddit. I wanted to take a moment to list some of the more notable fixes listed in those, which will presumably carry over to the live build, if the bugs even existed there in the first place. First, they've fixed a bug where the threat indicator would not appear for grenades dropped, not thrown, by eliminated operators. This often led to accidental team killing. They fixed the total ammunition count on some weapons, as it had been incorrect. They fixed the bug where some weapons, like the G36C, had muffled sounds. The developers have worked hard to fix and improve various VFX, SFX, and audio issues. Finally, a patch to the exploit wherein the game would crash after filling the text chat with specific characters and sending the message has been applied. High Caliber will also introduce some new and shiny features to the game. First, Elite 2.0 will be unveiling its full rollout. Players can customize Operator's Elite's headgear, uniform, unique abilities, and animation. Regardless of Elite status, all players have gained access to a new appearance menu on every Operator, which can be used to customize their Operator's headgear, uniform, victory celebrations if the Elite is unlocked, Operator portraits, and card backgrounds. The card backgrounds have options between red, blue, and gray, as well as gold for Operators with Elites. The card's customization will be apparent during the planning phase, in kill cams, in spectator view, and in the operator pick list. Ubisoft is also introducing a new kind of 3D weapon skin into the game, called Exotic Skins. These skins will have a unique 3D and animated effect. The High Caliber Battle Pass will include some of these skins in its progression. The Battle Pass itself will also be receiving some changes, first of which will be the first win of the day bonus. When you win any PvP playlist game within 24 hours of the first match played, you will earn extra Battle Pass points. The time starts at the first match played and resets every day. Included in the Battle Pass update is an update to the Battle Point Boosters, which will now grant a 30% bonus to you, 10% bonus to teammates, and a 30% bonus for a team with at least 3 boosters active. The bonuses can be stacked for up to 100% bonus points. One feature that was supposed to come in high caliber but was delayed due to technical debts regarding map design is camera disconnection. Valkyrie's black eyes, Maestro's evil eyes, and the bulletproof cameras will all lose signal after 10 seconds of being deployed outside. To regain signal, they must be picked up and redeployed elsewhere. This is an extraordinary change to Valkyrie, who's notorious for hard-to-find outdoor cameras. While she will lose the ability to have prolonged outdoor intel, players will have to keep in mind that this does mean more guaranteed cameras on the inside of the map. This change was supposed to release on season launch, but during the test server, some bugs cropped up that would take much longer than the remainder of the test phase to fix. Ubisoft was very forward and thorough in their explanation of the issues in their tweet, but the summary is that many maps, particularly older ones, had boundaries between inside and outside that were roughly drawn, since much larger gadgets were in mind during their creation. Some of those boundaries were even defined manually. This means that there are some areas in some maps that you may throw a Valkyrie cam indoors, but it will be detected as being outdoors, thus losing signal. The developers will need to adjust the boundaries on all maps for the camera disconnection to work as intended, and they predict this fix will delay the change into 2022. During the High Caliber reveal, we were also made privy to some features that are planned for the near future, but will not release on the launch of High Caliber. Firstly, the Goya rework, which was mentioned long ago, has been delayed once more. As other operators have shifted and changed, the developers discovered that the change they had in mind for Goyo would need to be tweaked to better fit in the current climate. The change would also require they redo all of his animations, which would take more time than they originally anticipated. A timeline was not given for Goyo's rework release. Ubisoft detailed their continuing efforts for player protections in their developer blog. They are working on three fronts to meet this end. The developer's responsibility, will be to provide options to prevent malicious actors from using a player's livestream to gather unfair information or to act in a disruptive manner. The other two fronts will be to control and limit the data shared from your account to third-party sites, apps, and overlays, and to ensure that account data and game telemetry are respected by those third parties. Presumably, this will have effects on R6 tracker and tab stats. Personally, I don't mind these overlays being restricted, 
as they do provide unfair information which the game itself does not provide to all players, such as operator ban suggestions or insights on who the opposition may play. More options will be coming to the Privacy tab in the future as well. These options include appearing as a nickname, Players will be able to create and use a temporary display name which will be used directly in-game and not interfere with their legacy name. It will not be cross-linked and can be changed at any time, including between matches. The second option is appearing as you. Since both legacy and alternative names can be used as primary indicators of your identity by malicious players, this option will replace your name on your screen with the word you, so people won't know your username or nickname by watching your stream. The third option is hiding other players. Since surrounding information can be used for identification, this option will generate pseudonyms for all usernames on the streamer's screen during the match except for their own. This includes teammates and opponents. These options are planned to release during High Caliber, but not at launch. They will be released to a small pool of trusted content creators first to ensure that the features cannot be exploited by malicious parties such as cheaters. Following success with that group, the options will go through a gradual rollout plan to the whole community. Ubisoft also plans to test an experimental iteration of account identity privacy, which will conceal a Ubisoft account name with a randomly generated username and profile avatar to protect the player. This would also prevent stream snipers from using third-party tools like overlays to reveal players' identities. They are unsure if this experiment will be successful, but if so, it will eventually be included in the public release. Finally, in Year 7, the test server will be introducing a reward system, which will cross over into the live build. Many of these changes are long-awaited, and I am happy to see many of them receive realistic timelines for release. The continuously improving streamer protections will hopefully bring back positivity to the content creator side of Siege, which in turn will hopefully open the doors wider to new players, who are no doubt affected and persuaded by the overwhelming negativity displayed by many content creators in the community currently. High Caliber isn't quite as heavy on features and changes as Crystal Guards seem to be, but the changes it is introducing are very interesting and revolutionary, and I believe they are important in keeping the game healthy and moving forward. I didn't get to play Thorn a lot on the test server, but from what I did, she is a very exciting operator, and I look forward to seeing her integration into the meta. Beyond that, I'm even more excited to develop new Outback strategies and ideas for the bulletproof cameras. I've already switched some of my operator's kits on the live build in preparation for the new season. As always, if this video was helpful to you, please consider liking the video and comment down below what you're looking forward to most. If you like Siege content, consider subscribing to my channel. High Caliber will release on Tuesday, November 30th, and I hope to see you all there.